Hello, everybody out there on YouTube. We are the middle-aged guys. We bullshit about nothing. I am the Reverend. The theme here. Ram House One. And this particular video is actually coming on the heels of the great 20th anniversary of something that hit the particular industry, had its particular impact, maybe not as much as some people remember it to actually have. But what I'm talking about simply, guys, you have it ready? On three. One, two, three. The Nintendo 64. The first official 64-bit uh, console out there. Uh, actual real 64-bit console out there. Uh, the <laughs> Nintendo 64 was released out. Actually, the official release date for the United States was September 29th, 1996. It broke street date, actually. I believe uh, there was either there was a Walmart in like Arizona or Oregon that that broke street date on it on September 26, 1996, and it started selling it all retailers after that. Um, th what happened to Walmart is that they lost out on a lot of uh, advertisement dollars uh, because they did that, and that's the reason why a lot of retailers are very strict about hitting uh, street date. Reason why I remember that even now over 20 fucking years later or almost 20 years later is that my very first job in retail in the video game industry was actually working for EB Games back before they got bought out by GameStop. And my very first day on the job was September 26, 1996. I remember the day exactly because I came in for the afternoon shift pretty much to go ahead and finish up all the way until closing. And um, my manager at the time, Keith, he sat there and said, um, look, I know it's your first day, but I've got this to say. The N64 broke street date. I can't fucking train you today. What I want you to do is whatever I ask you to do, do it explicitly. Don't ask too many questions. You know, uh, don't worry about it. He's like, just follow every fucking instruction that I give you. We'll make it through this day because it's already been fucking crazy and it's going to continue to be crazy. And that's how my day went. And that was pretty much kind of like my crash, crash course introduction to the, uh, uh, to the industry and also to the Nintendo 64. Um, the funny thing about this particular system, uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to spout off a few uh, a few uh, facts about it before I, I go out of my way and actually uh, uh, open up the floor. The system was actually the very first system with an analog controller packed in in the box, okay? Um, we've said multiple, multiple times that Nintendo is very much responsible for a lot of the innovations that you see at, at home console play. And yeah, a big a big contr contribution was that particular analog stick right there, okay? Uh, a lot of systems, well, excuse me, up until that point, the only system that had an analog controller was the PC, and that was pretty much relegated to flight controls, okay? But this right here, along with Mario 64, demonstrated what analog would do for, for home consoles, okay? Now, the controller itself is actually pretty much an example of, you know, uh, form and function working together. This thing, I will say it right now, looks like something out of a fucking cartoon. Okay, it looks like a joke. But the reason why it's set up that way is that you have three different fucking configurations that you can use, shoulder buttons, Z trigger at the bottom. This right here can be used for accessories like a memory card or a, a rumble pack, uh, which the Dreamcast would do with the uh, with the jump pack. Six buttons on the face, you know. But no Street Fighter came out for it. Yeah, and I'm I'm gonna say right now, Killer Instinct. You know, I, I I'm almost tempted to say that it doesn't count, but let's put that aside for the later. All right. But yeah, <laughs> you know, functionality and controllers right here. You know. Not only that, but if you look at the front of the Nintendo 64 itself, four fucking ports, okay? This was built 
with couch multiplayer on uh, in mind, whether it's co-op or versus. Like anybody who is who is from the late '90s who knows about doing split screen on Goldeneye knows exactly how valuable this shit is. All right. Um, you know, fucking groundbreaking. Okay. The other thing that it was very groundbreaking was this. The expansion. Yeah. The very first console that accommodated expansion memory. This right here increased the onboard RAM from two megs to four megs. Doesn't sound like a lot, but with certain titles, oh my God, it made a huge fucking difference with the, with the visual fidelity, you know? Um, Despite all of that, the Nintendo 64 didn't see as much success as Nintendo hoped it to be. It was part of the fifth generation of consoles along with the, with the PlayStation and the Sega Saturn. Um, in the end, it ended up selling 32.93 million, almost 33 million units worldwide. Um, and it went out of production. It was finally discontinued. I believe in 2003. 2003. Yep. Uh, it, it had its, its four year run, which is really kind of short for Nintendo consoles, but it came out, it went. And even though it wasn't the huge, um, the huge success that Nintendo hoped it to be, it still has a very, very uh, special place in the video game industry. Um, Don't forget I monopolize, <laughs> what's up? Oh, yeah, that never came here. That never came here. That never came here. Yeah, that never came here. We know about that, but that never, never came here. All See, right. that, that kind of reminds me of the way the Famicom was with its disk drive. Yep. 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 And Nintendo was going to bring that back, but they didn't come, that didn't come here, just like the Famicom one didn't come here. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, you know, the thing about the... Oh, no the 64, the thing about the 64 DD was that it only released like 13 titles uh, over in Japan. Oh, just the same as the 64. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> or actually the same as the Virtual Boy. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> back on topic, that guys, before I, I monopolize any more time, what are your memories in uh, – about the Nintendo 64. I, I know we're all old enough to, to, to uh, remember it. Um, okay, I remember that, that, Okay, I remember that this was supposed to be called the Ultra 64. The Ultra 64 that was advertised with the arcade version of the first Killer Instinct available for your home in 1995, only on Nintendo Ultra 64. Cruising USA? And Cruising USA was another. Yep. And I was like, I'm going to get those games. I'm going to get those games. And then, first of all, they delayed the fucking system because they they weren't. This was the result of Nintendo and, and Sony not pairing up. Yep, pretty much. You know what's, what's, you know what's funny is that the backbone of the Nintendo 64 is a, silic, is a custom silicon graphics chip. Well, allowed them to go ahead and do a lot of the rendering for Killer Instinct and also the uh, the Donkey Kong countries that came out later. But you know what was funny about that was that before Silicon Graphics marketed out their their proprietary chip and their hardware to Nintendo, they actually approached Sega at one time as far as asking them, "Hey, look, we've got something that we think would be really cool for our video games. What do you guys think about this?" And Sega of Japan told them, no, we already have something in mind. You know, uh, we have competitors who happen to be up in Washington that maybe if you want to go ahead and talk to them about it, go ahead and talk to them. But we're all set with ours because they had already had uh, something in mind for the, uh, for the Saturn. So could you imagine a Sega Saturn that had a fucking DVD drive with – the fucking graphical and sound hardware of this. Games is what matters here. Um, And the thing about it is, with this system here, it was cartridge-based, as you all may know by now. That's what pretty much damaged it from the get-go. Many people were moving from cartridge to the CD age. 
and cartridges were more expensive. Therefore, this was more expensive and complicated to develop for. So most developers went the cheaper route, which was the PlayStation and or the Saturn at that time. Yeah. Yes, the couch co-op, great. There are certain games that I played for it and I had great times with it. But I'm still upset. I'm still I haven't gotten over the fact that Killer Instinct One was supposed to be <laughs> the thing it was supposed to be the ultra fucking sixty four and that never fucking happened. And Cruising USA was mediocre compared to the arcade game. Yep. yep. The arcade game First of all, they fucked up on the music, and I'm like, wait a second, why? How did that happen? Well, you know the arcade, the arcade systems were CD-based systems. Understood. And that's where that's where this thing really, really messed up at. And they lost a lot of third-party publishers. A lot of them. They jumped on PlayStation. And if this would have had the third-party support, PlayStation wouldn't have nearly got the success that it got. Imagine it. I mean, think about what Nintendo, Super Nintendo and Nintendo had as far as third party. And they left this. Hmm. Konami left this. Capcom left this. You know, th those are two strong ones right there. Hmm. And it was like, fuck, man. Um, okay, Final Fantasies didn't go on this thing. Not the ones that everybody wanted. Yeah, Square left him, like, really quick. Square tracked me to the way. Mm -hmm. Capcom, as far as I know, Resident Evil 2. And Mega Man Legends 64. Yeah. And, Mag and Mega Man Legends 64 are the only two Capcom games that went on this thing. Mm -hmm. Think about the success that Capcom had on the Super Nintendo. And they were going to branch out to this and make this the arcade system that the Saturn was. But it didn't happen. And even though I had some fun times on this thing, and I still own it, and, and uh, no, fuck, I hated GoldenEye. I hated the Golden Gun. I get shot in toes, and I die. I hate that shit. <laughs> I like Perfect Dark, but I hated fucking GoldenEye. Um, Red Mouse, what are your thoughts? Yeah, on this go ahead. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the uh, the on the this. Nintendo 64. Well, my thoughts are this. Um, I was not in the United States at the time of the launch. I was actually in Japan. So uh, Yeah, neither was I. Um, I got the system. My, my 64 is a, a Japanese version. I never got around to owning an uh, American version. Oh, so you only got four games for yours. <laughs> no, I got some. <laughs> Yeah, four um, or so. Actually, uh, one of the one kind of funny memory that I had was um, there's a place called uh, SS Sam's, which represents um, single sailors and marines. And uh, the sixty four was was just came out, and you know this was the place to be, you know, during the week when you're not going to other cities and all. And I remember they had a whole bunch of these sitting at the place on, you know, TVs. And the uh, theme, because we got in a conversation with one of our one of our homeboys on the ship, uh, and he said, you know, the Nintendo 64 and whatnot. And then so theme stacked a Nintendo 64 and a PlayStation on top of each other. And uh, what would you call it? Oh God, I, I I was vaguely remembering this until you started explaining. Oh Lord, no, because at first it was PlayStations. <laughs> I put two PlayStations on top of each other. I was like, you want PS2? There's PS2. And then I stacked this on top of the PS2, both uh, the PS2. I stacked this on top of the both PlayStations and I called it the Nintendo 67. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's just a little hilarious thing. But um, anyway, uh, so yeah, I, w I wasn't in America during this, when the 64 was launched, so I, I only have Japanese. 
I was still in the United States when the Japanese 64 was released. And there were some that were imported to game stores. Oh. Because I, rem- because I remember there was a game store called, called Game Land. And they had the Japanese 64 there. So I actually played Super Mario 64, the and Japanese that's... version, and didn't know what the fuck was going on and didn't know what the fuck I was doing. Yeah. Speaking of the Japanese version, I got it right here. Complete box. I've got a Japanese version for Mario 64 also. The funny thing about the the Nintendo 64 is that, like I said, that was like my introduction to to retail working with with video games behind the other side of the counter. And, um, yeah, my God, did these things sell out fucking quick. And the... You know, the one thing that really kind of hurt this particular console was the fact that its launch library was weak. Weak. Well, it had only five or six games to it. Uh, yeah. it no, it the first uh-huh. Mario, Pilot Wings. And that was it for like almost the first three months. Yeah. Yeah, and the thing is, is that they weren't cheap either. Mario, when it came out, was sixty nine ninety nine. Fucking <laughs> Pilot Wings was seventy nine ninety nine when it came uh. out. You know, yeah. I remember a lot of people going out of their way and buying the system at launch, getting sick of it within a month. And then instead of going out of their way to going over to game land to go ahead and trade it in for money, sitting outside on the bench in the middle of the mall in front of fucking EB where I worked at with a sign. I have a Nintendo 64 and it in, in, in the box. Okay. It came out, it retailed for for two forty nine ninety nine, okay, and they would sit there and they would have a sign Nintendo sixty four right here with one controller and a game five hundred dollars. And that person, I shit you not, would maybe be sitting out there for two hours max. Somebody would walk up to them, buy that fucking system already used, already fucking played, okay, with the system, a controller, fucking Mario sixty four to go ahead and take it away to a fucking box it up for fucking uh, Christmas. All right. Yeah, my my particular memories of the Nintendo 64 are are a little bit different than other people's memories. All right. Let me just be honest. This particular unit right here, I did not get this unit until 1998. When I was already living up in Washington and I was working for Nintendo at the time, uh, I will tell you, if I'd never worked at Nintendo, I would not own a Nintendo 64. Because one of the, one of the things that they used to compensate temps who came in to go ahead and work in the call center was that, hey, you're going to work for us. As a perk, not only are you going to sit there and you're going you're gonna to be making a, a uh, biweekly uh, uh, hourly pay and everything else, but we're going to give you one of our systems – uh, you know, and then you have access to the um, Nintendo store. And yeah, that's how I came upon this particular system. If I wasn't ever working at Nintendo, I wouldn't have this fucking system. Just to tell you the truth, it doesn't have that many games that I am really, um, really interested in. Um, now, that's not to say that I didn't build up my library to an amount where I'm like, okay, I can actually justify owning this thing and keeping it around. But yeah, this was, there was a lot of things going on. Like, like what the theme said, um, a lot of people jumped off of Nintendo and went to Sony. Okay. Because let's be on the, the licensing practices and, and contracts that they had with third party publishers from the NES going into the Super Nintendo and everything else turned a lot of publishers off because they sat there. They're like, Hey, look, we're putting out a game. And because we have to play, pay licensing fees, it's going to be $10 more at fucking retail. You're going to put out a game at the same time. And it's going to be $10 less. How are we going to fucking compete and make our money back? And you're telling us we can't even make as many games as we want over the year. All right, or we we've got a shitload of games that we have published in Japan, and you're telling us that we can't bring over certain titles to the U.S. Well, well, the extra ten dollars is for no load times. That was that was part of the script as far as what we had to sit there and and tell people as far as reasons to buy a Nintendo sixty four over a Dreamcast and a, and a PlayStation <laughs> it was no load times. But yeah, so 
this right here, this big black box, it not only symbolizes, you know, a lot of things that Nintendo directly contributed to the, the industry, but it also symbolizes a huge downfall in their market command and their market share. This yeah. is where the decline actually started for their consoles. For Nintendo, for, yes. For the, uh, the third party, absolutely. Yes. Definitely. That's when third party got up and vacated. Yeah. They left in, in droves. Is what happened. No. But that's not to say that there aren't games on the system that we, we don't, uh, that we enjoy. Because just like with any system out there, or, okay, look, if you've watched enough of our videos, we've stressed time and time again, it's not about the systems. I don't fucking play systems, all right? I play games. The yes. Team doesn't play systems, he plays games. Gray Mouse doesn't play systems, he plays games, all right? Whether we play with ourselves or other people, all right? We play games, okay? And the thing about it is that there were enough games that came out on the Nintendo 64 that we definitely liked, we definitely enjoyed, and we definitely spent time with. Otherwise, this thing would not have a spot on my shelf. It would not right. have a spot on my entertainment center. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit of show and tell. If you didn't, uh, if you didn't uh, um, expect that to happen, you know, for the next few minutes. Guys, uh, we'll go one by one. Games that you happen to have that, you know, made this system worthwhile having. Who wants to go first? Listen, this was one of the primary reasons to have a Nintendo 64 at one point. And this, the Rumble Pack. The Rumble Pack came with this thing. Yep. And it, and it had the perfect use for it. Um, damn it, I love the tank. Yeah, love love the tanks. Um, yeah, but now I play this on my freaking 3ds. <laughs> but this is the original. This is worthwhile. This was worth getting for the system at that time. I mean, fuck, wow. one of the best games I've ever played. Um, I wish that look, Cruising USA. If, if they would have done it just like this, then it would have been worthwhile. Because this one, everything was pretty much arcade perfect. Even the fucking music. Yep. Damn it. I mean, why? Why? All right. This one, I used to play all <laughs> the fucking time. All the time. Before it, EA had a monopoly on fucking all, all major fucking team sports and shit like that? <laughs> Right. This, oh my God. If you never play NBA Hang Time, it's basically like NBA Jam with a lot, a little bit more put into it. I mean, you had tricks, you had spinning, you had double dunks, and everything about this game functioned pretty well, especially the control with the analog stick. And then, of course, Everybody well known by now if you're on my channel. I'm a wrestling fan. And this is one of the best wrestling games I've ever played in life. Period. Period. I will still play this to this day. I still got my creative character creative characters on there. The theme is on there. My other character, Golden Ass Kicker is on there. Look, this was one of those games where I could pop in at any time with just about anybody that was around and have some fucking fun with it. Wrestling games, take note, you need to be more like this or Super Fire Pro Wrestling or Nasumi Championship Wrestling or Pro Wrestling for the NES. You need to fucking go back to this because this is when wrestling games were fucking fun. <laughs> what about you, Grey Mouse? What, what, are, what are a handful of games? Maybe keep it within four or five or so. Oh, yeah, this is just real quick. Yeah. Who, who goes without saying Super Mario 64? Oh, yeah. And then um, Donkey Kong 64. Oh, yeah. I well, mean, come on. If you didn't have Mario 64 for the system, for the 64, I don't, I don't understand. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. If 
for as much as Sony went out of their way to go ahead and push 3D onto the industry altogether, okay? Nothing broke it out and made it more acceptable to mainstream fans and, and mainstream consumers, casual consumers, than Mario fucking 64, all right? As much as Sony went out of their way and they completely banned fucking 2D games altogether for fucking years, okay? They sat there and they're like, everything has to be 3D. Everything has to fucking be 3D. Even though the best fucking titles that came out of the early years of the, of the, of the PlayStation were fucking 2D, Castlevania, uh, Sympathy of the Night, Hello, Sukoden, Hello, all right? Um, they went ahead and they, they were all about not only fucking pushing 3D onto the market, but trying to shove it up everybody's ass. You yeah. know, the problem was is that they didn't have a Mario 64 around to sit there and say, this is what it can give you as far as your gameplay experience. And Nintendo has to be thanked for that. And Go ahead, the, uh, the couple of games that for Battle 64... Oh, yeah, um, indeed. Yeah. And then, of course, I can't go without, you know, a video without talking about. Um, this has got to be one of the best Zeldas ever, the Ocarina of Time. This is a, a very. <laughs> this is a very uh, key point, Ocarina of Time. It, you know, the, the Zelda timeline has. Uh, Officially been done, and this is like one of the key cornerstone of that timeline. Yep. And then also died in Zelda too. Yep. Also, uh, Majora's Mask. I don't have that. I don't know what happened to my copy. <laughs> but these are, you know, these are some of the best games that, that were on the 64. And um, before I move on, one game, one particular franchise was not even on the 64, which is kind of crazy. From Nintendo. From Nintendo, it's called Metroid. There was never a Metroid 64. I don't think it could have worked. You know what's funny is that like, part of my, my history with the Nintendo 64 was the fact that I worked at Nintendo, and that's the only reason why I've got a Nintendo 64. I actually received a call from a guy saying that he had designs for a Metroid for Nintendo 64 and all that sort of things. Are okay? Now, the problem with that is that you can't sit there and accept anything like that over the phone because as a representative of the company, it can be considered legally binding, and that'll put you in a lot of deep shit. Yeah. Go ahead and say, yeah. okay, all, all that. And I had to sit there and, and run down the script with him on that. And, you know, the, the thing about it was that it wasn't – it didn't help that I believe back in a this old Nintendo Power um, uh, uh, – issue they had like tech demo screens where they showed like a chozo statue what it would look like if it was rendered out for use on the nintendo 64 mm -hmm. uh, and that fueled a lot of that you know um unfortunately they never got around to that uh they wouldn't actually get around that back until the the gamecube um which is uh, something altogether you know you know it's really disheartening that most of Nintendo's um, major powerhouses had a game on there. Castlevania, Zelda, Mario. You know, and, and I was like, no Metroid? But that's not to say that there wasn't good games on it. Because even as critical as I am for this system, you know, there, there was uh, quite a few uh, good games on it. Um, at least enough to go ahead and, you know, validate me having in the system. Like, one, one game off the top of my head, that's goes under everybody's radar as well. Ah. Okay. This did cover shooting before a lot of the modern cover shooting games out there. Okay. Uh, before Gears of War, this did cover shooting. Okay. From fucking Koei, who is now part of Tecmo. All right. Great game if you have to pick it up. Part two is on the um, PS2 and also the Xbox if you find that. All right. Another great game that's out there that doesn't get a lot of uh, a lot of credit, and you've heard about it on this fucking channel, Mischief Makers. Mischief Makers! By Treasure, okay? Completely out of the way and completely Japanese, but once you get oh. into actually playing it, you know, this is one of those games you can't get away with describing it to people. You have to let them play it. 
You got to play it. You yeah. cannot describe that game. Look, you shake things as you're <laughs> – that yep. is your attack. Yep. Shake, 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 shake. Oh my god! I didn't think it was that big of a deal until I got to like the third stage, and then all of a sudden she was gra- grabbing things on the stage and shaking the whole fucking yes. stage. I was like, yeah. "Oh!" Shake, shake, shake. Continuing on, you know, great games that are on the system. This yeah. guy, where has he had a bad game? Yeah, he's never been in a bad game. And Kirby, uh, what's this? The Crystal Shards. Is not, you know, it's not an exception to that. You know, he's never been in a bad game. And this is a great, great translation into 3D. Not as graceful as Mario 64, but still a very, very solid game. Okay. Now, another game that a lot of people kind of sleep on is this particular game right here, Hybrid Heaven by Konami, before they turned into spineless fucking slugs. Okay, leaving slime trails all, trails all over the place. And this also makes use of that memory pack. Uh, okay. Uh, I can describe it as this. It's an action RPG. When you get into, into uh, combat, not only is it co- close quarters combat, but it's close quarters combat where you are taking mutants and you're suplexing them on their heads and pile driving them or fucking, you know, kneeing them in the, in the head. This is a great fucking game. All right. Now, lastly, another one that kind of seems obvious, but has to be um, has to be has to be noted. Yeah, Rare was on the top of their game when they made this fucking. Yes. And I just want to mention this right now before you say anything else. Go ahead. There's a reason why it has an M rating. That's all I have to say. You know, that is the crudest humor. For the longest, game. Yeah, for the longest time, Nintendo was declared as, oh, Nintendo's that family-friendly company. It's all for little kids. They're never going to put anything out for adults on it. Rare listened to that. Nintendo listened to that. And this is also around the time that the ESRB and, and a whole bunch of other stuff, I think Columbine and a whole bunch of other shit was, was coming around. This was Rare's and Nintendo's big fuck you. Yeah. A whole bunch of critics and a whole bunch of detractors about Nintendo not Did Mortal Kombat Nintendo. Two and Mortal Kombat Three come on the Super Nintendo. Well, yeah, but that was that was around the time that the ESRB uh, was 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 set up. But remember, at the time, well, a, a, a thing that I heard even on the Nintendo Hotline, working on, on at their fucking call center, was, you know, well. Why would I get a Nintendo sixty four for my kid? I mean, he's like fourteen. You know, he's going to be looking at getting like other other games. In which case, the script went well, sir. You know, I understand that if you want to go ahead and get those particular systems for you know X Y Z kid or whatnot, you know, that they offer these particular things. But these, this is what the Nintendo sixty four offered. Uh, you know, I couldn't go out of my way and sit there and say, pick up Conquer's Bad for a Day. All right, uh, that prepubescent, pimply faced motherfucker who thinks that saying fuck and shit and, and making pussy jokes is equivalates to mature, all right, is going to go ahead and fawn all over that and jack off to it in, until he, he passes out and dreams about this bullshit, all right? I couldn't sit there and say that, um, but I really wanted to, okay? Um, but yeah, Conquer's Bad Fur Day, definitely a great game. You no. forgot to mention uh, Banjo and Kazooie. Well, I I would say that that's rare at the top of the game for another reason. Okay, but you know, obviously, twenty years later, Nintendo sixty four, a uh, great system. Um, I didn't sit there and expect it to to have quite the quite the impact on my life that it did. But you know what, it did, and some of that's maybe. A little bit out of, outside of what I initially expected and things like that, but you know what? I always love it when I sit there. I'm able to sit there and uh, and celebrate anniversaries for things that that make an impact in my life. And this right here, whether or not I was a fan or not, was a part of my life. You know. You know, with that. <laughs> If you guys have them, I think this uh, this requires a toast. 
<laughs> 20 years, Nintendo 64, not the biggest impact, but Nintendo is still plugging around. And shit, you're the only game in town, really. Cheers. Cheers. Do a barrel roll. <laughs> you know what? If I get drunk enough, I'll probably decide to go ahead and do that. With that, thank you for sticking all the way up to this point in time. If you're so kind, hit like, hit subscribe, leave us a comment below. We are the middle-aged guys. I am the Reverend. The theme here. Gray Mouse One. Once again, for the benefits of common sense, logic, and gaming. And thank you, Nintendo 64. You're supposed to be the Ultra. You're supposed to get us Killer Instinct One, but fine. You still have some great games on it, and you introduced 3D the way it was supposed to be done with two perspectives. Mario and Zelda. Zelda games. The best Zelda games ever. Mario and Zelda. Credits. Do a barrel roll. I want, me, I want myself a whiskey barrel right now. Wait a minute. I might already be there.